because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coach is excited to welcome LaSalle University head coach Ashley Howard to the share the game with us. And uh, Coach Howard just completed his third season at LaSalle and has LaSalle trending upward. Prior to his arrival at LaSalle, Howard spent five seasons as an assistant coach at Villanova, helping the Wildcats to a pair of national championships. Coach, welcome to the podcast. Chris, thanks for having me. Excited to join you today. Well, we're really excited to have you here. And uh, the obvious question comes uh, first about your the influence of Villanova and uh, Coach Jay Wright on your coaching philosophy. Well, so much of what I learned at Villanova is primarily about how important it is when you're building your program to have people who are who are all on the same page and all on the same mission, right? So from top to bottom, Coach Wright is very strategic about putting talented people in a position to do what they do best. And, and then it kind of correlates to everything that we do, even on the court. So, you know, we, we had a lot of talented guys at Villanova. And I learned how to play out of concepts and switch up defenses and, and put guys uh, that, are, that are really talented players in a position to make plays as opposed to just run plays and play unselfishly and, and, and play off of each other. So, you know, so much of what I learned at Villanova just has to do with putting talented people in the right place and encouraging them to work hard together. Well, I love that. And we're going to dive into some of the concepts and the different style that you play in terms of that. But I had a really influential head coach when I was an assistant, a strong personality, incredibly successful. And I know it took time, even though I knew I had to be myself, it still took time to kind of get to that level of comfort with what I wanted to do versus what I learned and what I knew was successful from my prior mentor. Did you go through a similar process in your first year? You know what? I, I went through the process of because I had I had so many great mentors, if I'm being honest, uh, Chris. And, and Coach Wright was probably the most well respected out of them all. But I worked for for uh, for Bruiser Flint. Uh, he was my college coach. I worked for Brew um, as a student assistant at Drexel, and then I worked for him for four years. And and Dr. John Giannini, I worked for. He gave me my first opportunity to coach as a young assistant, who's another well respected coach in his business and. And I spent a year with Chris Mack as well. And because I worked for all four guys, all different guys, all successful in their own right, you know, I have just a, a melting pot of different ideas and philosophies that could work. Sometimes it's good. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it puts me in a position where I can try to overthink things at times. But the fact that, 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 I, that I've had um, so many positive influences on me has given me a, a, a variety of different ways that that I can, you know, view the game and pivot and, and try to adjust based on our personnel at LaSalle. Well, that's such a great list. And uh, I, I know so much of it, too, is not just about the X's and O's. As you know, it's all about all the stuff about running a program and running the program off the court. And uh, I imagine all those influences had such a positive influence on how you run your program. Yes, they have. And, and you know, one of the things that, you know, you you try to do as a coach is you really try to go in and establish yourself and be yourself. And the common theme with with all of the guys that I work for is defense is the staple of of their programs. And and at LaSalle, we're trying to establish that identity, right? We want to be a a team that that holds our hat on defending. And and, and right now, you know, protecting the three-point line is something that's really important. So we try to do that with with ball pressure and, and, and guarding personnel. But now the, the challenge and the balance is doing that effectively without fouling, right? And we're still in the process now as, as we head into year four of getting good at both, protecting the three-point line, being good uh, defensively on the ball, um, and, and guarding without fouling. And as we go into this offseason, that's, that's, that's going to be a, a huge emphasis for us because I think if we can get better at, at not fouling and, and, and continuing to 
apply adequate pressure where we're still disruptive on the defensive end. I think that can make us uh, an even more effective team defensively. Well, it's, it's it, again, uh, for lack of a better word, modern basketball, you know, Coach Wright was certainly one of the first to adapt that at the NCAA level. And uh, very similar, uh, you're playing out of concepts and you're playing positionless on offense. And can you talk to us a little bit more about what that means in your program? So, you know, what, what it means is, you know, we, we try to put our guys in positions uh, where, where they can make basketball plays and, and make good decisions, right? And, and you know, it's, it's a lot easier when you have guys that can dribble, pass, and shoot uh, at all positions. And, um, you know, at times, uh, you know, we, you know, we, at times it may appear like we give our guys a lot of freedom. Well, the one thing that, you know, we want to do is we want to encourage our guys to take open shots. And, and, and I think you, you develop confidence that way on offense. You know, if, if you're second guessing yourself, um, you know, and, and, and you don't believe that the coach has faith in you to shoot the ball, then, 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 you know, you, you won't be as effective as a player. That's just in my opinion. So, you know, our first concept is catching the shoot. We always want our guys to be on, be on the attack when they catch the ball um, and, and be a threat to shoot it. And then everything goes off of that, you know, playing off of your shot, um, you know, seeing the floor, um, you know, reading closeouts and then, um, you know, being able to attack closeouts, which puts us into our next concept, uh, which we talk about, um, you know, driving space. A lot of people uh, call it drive and kick. Um, but, but, you know, we don't mind, you know, our guys shooting, you know, floaters and, and, and pull up jumpers. I know a lot of people, um, you know, you know, have, have gotten away from it. You know, I believe that, you know, if, if you had, if you can effectively make a pull up jump shot, I think it makes you a three level score. Um, I know, you know, we, you know, we do a lot of talking, uh, in the game today about guys that can score at all three levels. So, you know, we want our guys to be able to do that. We want our guys to be able to shoot the three. We want our guys to be able to get into the range zone and, and, and make hop jumpers and, and floaters and, um, you know, creative finishes playing off of both pivot feet and, and, um, but, but we also want to teach our guys how to make the right reads now and not force contested shots, uh, over to help, um, when you're in positions where you don't have a good shot, um, uh, in the mid range, uh, you know, then we want to encourage you to kick the ball and that's where our driving space concept comes into play. Um, and, 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 and so much of, you know, a, a offense that, that is based on, you know, um, you know, using inter interchangeable pieces is all about spacing and player movement and ball movement. Right. So, you know, spacing is extremely important. Um, and, you know, you know, with good spacing, um, you know, presents opportunities to reverse the ball. So, you know, one of our next concepts, we call it reverse the ball um, and, and, and make plays. So we, we like to, you know, out of our drive and space game, you know, play in and out. If we have an open shot, we take it. Uh, if we have uh, an opportunity to attack a closeout, we'll attack it. But if we don't have that opportunity, we don't want to be ball stoppers. We want to move the ball. We want to keep the ball moving, get the ball from one side of the floor to, to the other. And I think if you look at any good team on offense, when they have that type of movement and the ball isn't stopping, then, you know, it, it creates other opportunities, whether it's, you know, additional open shots, um, additional driving lanes. Um, it just, it just makes your offense that much more effective. And, and for us, you know, we're, we're, we're still in the process of, of really, um, you know, taking, you know, our offensive concepts to the next level. And I think a lot of it has to do with recruiting. I think a lot of it has to do with, the continued development of our players. And we're excited about, um, you know, where we are um, in regards to that, uh, you know, and, and, and you'll see our team next year um, with, with Clifton Moore, who, who played a lot of five for us, you know, Cliff can shoot the three, he can face up, he can drive. Um, so now when you have a, a, a team that has five guys on the floor that can, that can dribble pass and shoot, it makes your offense that much more effective as long as guys are willing to share the basketball, uh, be unselfish, and, um, and, and, and continue to move and, and, and have good spacing and movement. That's so great for you to share some of these concepts and these ideas and uh, a lot to unpack. And let's start first with the, the initial one that comes to mind is that a lot of the players that you recruit, whether they're transfers or high school players, are used to structure and sets versus concepts. 
So what do you find their biggest challenges in terms of getting them to play within concepts more than structure-based offense? Really just understanding when their opportunities to to attack are, you know, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, you know, I hear from our guys is, you know, um, you know, you know, they, they, it's almost like they want to play ran for them uh, at times. And it's like, yo, man, like recognize the opportunity. That ball came to you in the corner and you weren't ready to shoot. So that's on you. You got to be ready to shoot. You got to always be in attack mode. And that's why in our system, we want to have, you know, aggressive, confident offensive players. We want to have guys that, 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 are, that are looking to make plays, that are looking to be aggressive, but also um, are unselfish enough to, you know, understand that, you know, you know, being aggressive to make a play doesn't mean I have to shoot it every time. It just means that, you know, when the ball comes to me, I, I just need to be ready to, um, to take what the defense gives me and make an aggressive play. So I think, you know, early on, you know, just recognizing when your opportunities uh, present, present themselves to you. And, you know, one of the things in college is, you know, in high school, guys coast and, and, they, and, they, and they play, um, you know, pretty much like 70% most of the time. Where in college, you know, we want, you know, you know, good coaches, they want their guys always to be engaged, always to be in attack mode and always to be ready. And, and, and we're the same way. We don't want our guys to be on the floor at any given time and not be a threat. So just understanding and recognizing the opportunities to uh, be aggressive, to to make plays and to, um, you know, you know, understand the difference of when to when to dribble pass and, 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 and when to shoot the ball. Yeah, it's great stuff. And and one of the terms that I believe I got from Villanova and you guys is this drive to score concept, which you talk about drive in space, but it's also being a threat when you drive, right? And you find that so many players drive the ball thinking pass rather than score. And I love that mentality of that terminology. So, you know, it's it it comes from, you know, you know, catching the shoot first. And then the next thing is, you know, being an aggressive driver. And putting the pressure on the defense, but if the def- if the defense knows that you're not trying to come off of a ball screen and and get downhill to score the ball, then it's easy for them to you know play in between you um, and then you know make a a, a recovery uh, and get back to the guy when when you had an advantage of gu- having two guys guarding one, you know um, you know that's that's the you know you know that's what makes you know, our offense effective. Like we want our guys to come off, come downhill, try to be in attack mode, force that forward to have to guard you coming off of a ball screen. Cause if the forward doesn't think that you're going to shoot or if he doesn't think you're coming off of that thing to pass uh, to, to get to the rim, I'm sorry. If he thinks you're just coming off kind of probing, looking to pass, then it's, you know, you're not really putting any pressure on them and it makes it easy for, for the defense to, to help and then recover and get back to being matched up. So the shoot or drive decision becomes such an important part of your concept. So I'm wondering, how, how do you teach and develop that for your players? Well, I, I think as soon as you feel two guys guarding you, get off the ball, right? So, so being aggressive to catch the shoot, like if, you have a, if you're able to attack a closeout and, and, um, and, and, and you're wide open to get to the rim or you're wide open to get to a, to a mid-range pull-up jump shot, by all means, take it. But if you drive and you see a secondary defender is guarding you, right, then your natural instinct needs to be, okay, next play, right? Because, you know, the whole concept of our offense is we want to get two guys guarding one. And as soon as we get two guys guarding one, we want to be able to make quick decisions to get that next guy shot. Because if two guys are guarding one, somebody's open, either on the initial pass or if we continue to move the ball and and reverse it, you know, we we know that, you know, we'll be able to get somebody else a shot uh, within our concepts, uh, a wide open catch the shoot jumper, as long as the ball doesn't stick and we can ke- keep the ball moving, if that makes sense, Chris. Hey, this is Chris Oliver from the Basketball Podcast. It's that time of year again, and all eyes are now on pro basketball and the start of Major League Baseball season. BetOnline.ag has all the betting action. In the NBA, the conference races are heating up as teams prepare to make their run for the playoffs. And if baseball is your first love, Bet Online has you covered. If you love hockey, golf, MMA, and championship boxing, Bet Online has it all. Every sport 
every game, every matchup. BetOnline has you covered for all the odds and real-time updates and is the place to be for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to place and check in on all your favorite sports bets all the time. Head to the website or use your mobile device and bring home the game with BetOnline. Hey coach, have you heard of Locker Room? Locker Room is live audio-only sports talk platform. It's free to download and free to use. You're going to be able to talk to me, other fans, athletes, and insiders in real time. It's perfect for watch parties, debates, post-game breakdowns, and reacting to breaking news. And you can share your own experience on the app. All you need to do is download the Locker Room app for free in the iOS App Store. Create a profile, link your Twitter, and start being involved in the Locker Room. It totally makes sense off the dribble, off the bounce. And I'm wondering, is there an even more specific cue? Like, are you are you reading chest of the defender in terms of help, or are there different to specific cues you're giving the players? Well, we we do we do we do encourage our guys to read chest. Um, you know, but you know, the the one thing it's 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 more of a feel, right? And and you know, and and as we talk through this, I think the other thing that that is important to to understand is, you know, passing is so important, right? So, so being comfortable and being a willing passer and being willing to, to move the ball and, and recognize, you know, I got two guys guarding me and not over dribble in those situations is so key, right? To, to playing out of our concepts. And one of the things um, that we talk about, even within um, and, and our final concept is what we call uh, post and rip. And, you know, even after um, you know, you, you get in a driving space. If I drive the ball and I get into the paint and, you know, the defense is loading and I'm able to, to, to find an open man, we believe that if we post the ball as well and we throw it inside and, and we get a guy, you know, you know, uh, inside the post and our guy is facing up or he can do a back down move, it's the same thing out of the post. If we can get two guys guarding one and we can move the ball quickly to, to get the ball inside and out to get us open shots, it, it, it you know, all the concepts come together. So like post and rip and drive and space really become the same type of deal. Uh, but with that being said, you have to have individual players who are putting the pressure on the defense that demand uh, a help or for somebody to dig or for somebody to attack you, if that makes sense, right? So a lot of times, you know, when teams play against us, I think, you know, the thing teams want to do is they they just want to allow guys to to guard you straight up, right? They know we want to get three, so you know they stay at home on shooters and and you know they they encourage guys to you know kind of space and stay in between their man in the basket and make one on one plays, right? And and that's and that's great. Um, so you know the thing that we encourage our guys to do is just to be poised and patient. You don't have to make a quick decision. So on these drives, we want you to get in there, jump stop, be patient. Make two people actually guard you and then make the pass. You drive, get in there, be patient. If, if uh, the, the secondary defender doesn't guard you, all right, be poised, be patient, take your time, keep your dribble alive, back down, pivot, use a shot fake or two to, to get that defender out of his stance and then you know go up and score or get fouled. I think a lot of times in our concepts, and I think this is what you're alluding to, Chris, is you know the thing that makes it a challenge is when our guys – try to make decisions playing too fast or too quick. You have to slow down and be poised and be patient when you get the ball in the, in, in the paint. And, and, and that gives you the ability to, to, to make a, an effective decision um, as to whether or not to pass or shoot, if that makes sense. Coach, it makes total sense. And I know coaches that are listening are so excited hearing you talk about this because, I mean, as you're talking, I can visualize you coaching it and enjoying coaching this way. Right. It's got to be fun to be able to coach, to be able to teach your how players how to play and then to be able to let them play. No, it does. But, you know, but but like you said, you know, we're you know, we're, we're in the stages of building our program and it takes of time <laughs> to develop these concepts. So a lot of times it sounds like I, it sounds fun right now. when I'm talking it, <laughs> talking through it, but it's a challenge for our guys, because you know, if you're used to running plays, set plays every time down the floor. And now we're giving you the freedom. You know, you got to go through the, the the learning and the growing pains of uh, getting comfortable with these concepts. But but it's a really uh, fun style to coach, and 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 then once you master it, it's a it's a really fun style and, and way to play the game of basketball. 
I can totally picture the struggle of it as well in that sense. And I think that's why a lot of coaches kind of abandon it. It's somewhat easier to go to sets and structure. And there's nothing wrong with sets and structure. I'm not saying that. But in terms of this style, I think the other part is this importance of having upper year players, which now you are starting to get players that have gone through this and can help teach the younger or the newcomers to your program these concepts, right? Yep. And and the other thing too, Chris, is, you know, it gives us a baseline, right? So, you know, we we'll run set plays at times, you know, we 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 won't. At times we'll just, you know, we'll we'll just we'll just we'll just play out of out of out of our concepts. Um, but even when we run plays, it gives us a baseline so that if we run a play to get the ball in the post, okay, we got the ball in the post, now we can play out of our concepts. You know, you you may run a play um to get a guy a shot. And, you know, if the guy, you know, gets a shot and defender flies at him and now he attacks a closeout. Now we all know once that guy attacks a closeout, where we're going, how the floor should look and, and, and where and where we're spacing. Right. So, you know, you know, we, it gives us the ability to play out of our concepts, but it also gives us the ability to know what our reads are and know how we're reacting when we actually are in positions where we run set plays as well. A curious question after having watched you guys a lot on Synergy and uh, obviously watching Villanova over the years, is it matchup based in terms of, you know, you don't run sets, but do you go into games or within the games, do you go to let your players know that certain matches you want to attack defensively or certain matchups you want to attack with your best offensive players? Exactly. So, you know, it is it is matchup based a lot of times. Um, because again, the, 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 the primary objective is to get two guys guarding one. So if you're, you're, if you're, if you're trying to exploit a matchup where you don't necessarily have an advantage, then, you know, the concepts don't, don't work as effectively. But if you, um, can, can find uh, a mismatch, if you can find a way to create advantages and exploit, um, your advantages, now you're putting yourself in a position where, you know, the concepts can all come together because you you know, you're, you're, you're going into a situation where you're making two guys guard one, or you're putting uh, a, one of your players in a position where they have an advantage to, to go and make an aggressive play. You've mentioned this a few times and you talked about the back end, and I, I think coaches generally call it a Barkley. I don't know what you guys call it, but if we can all picture Jalen Brunson doing it now, is that, is that sometimes rebased or is that sometimes matchup based as well that you tell certain players, Hey, listen, let's go to a Barkley here. Because you, have, it's it's a really a simple way to get to the post, right? And to be able to draw two, as you say. Yeah. So you know, you know what we consider the Barkley is if you're being denied um, on the wing, and now the uh, you know you're being denied on the wing, and 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 now you're 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 getting open, right? So the 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 whole um, the the motion of you know getting your top foot uh, over the defender and 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 opening up and pretty much posting up on the perimeter. That's what we consider a Barkley. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, with, with Jalen, we would we we knew that Jalen was was as crafty and as savvy as they come. So we could we could, you know, post Jalen up um, and, and he could catch it 15 feet out and 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 just kind of, you know, back you down, face you up, drive, wheel and deal and do your thing. But again, you're talking about a guy that's a great uh, has a great feel for the game, can read the floor, great passer, can score has a variety of moves in the post. And, you know, I think the most important thing about Jalen is like he was always extremely poised uh, when he got in the paint. He never, he never would rush or panic. So, you know, it gave him the ability to, to make, um, you know, you know uh, solid, uh, aggressive plays, um, either scoring, getting fouled, or, or finding an open man once he got the ball in, in, in the paint. Well, and, and I don't know the terminology used, but a lot of these things are what uh, Doug Novak has and Jimmy Tillett have pioneered as kind of like called protection plans. That it's it's ways to be able to get out of trouble on a drive or to turn a drive that gets stopped into a positive, right? Mm-hmm. And in a sense, a Barkley's that, a back pivot is that. And then I believe also that you guys do a lot of the dribble under the basket to keep your dribble alive, which I call a Nash, and I'm not sure what you guys call but is part of the mentality as well within these concepts that if they stop you, you have a way to get out of trouble. Exactly. So, you know, we call it, you, you call it a Nash, we call it a keep. So, you know, you just keep your dribble alive and, and, you know, you, you know, you go from, from, from one, one, one porch to the next, um, you know, probing, 
And, and then I think a significant part of, you know, all of those is, you know, you know, whether you're jump stopping and you're pivoting or you're keeping your dribble alive, you know, the guys on the perimeter, they have to do their job as well to get in the vision of the shooter. And if they're, and if they're overplayed, then, you know, that's where, you know, you, you know, have opportunities to, to, to back cut um, to the basket. Right. So, you know, in a, in a perfect world, you know, if we're playing, if we're playing against, you know, a, a unbelievable defensive team and they're guarding us one-on-one effectively and, you know, they're standing home on shooters and our guys are driving and they're getting stuck in the lane. You know, I think the last resort for us now is to, you know, get hard cuts to get in the vision of the, of the, of the driver. And if that guy's denied, then they get a hard second cut, uh, uh, which is a backdoor cut to the basket uh, to try to, um, you know, you know, get give ourselves a last second effort to, to, you know, get a backdoor layup. Or even if that guy gets stuck in the paint now, that guy goes, he gets stuck, he's pivoting, he's pivoting. At least he wants to get the ball up on the rim. If you're second cutting, now you're putting yourself in a position where you can attack the offensive glass and, and, and clean up any, any missed shot opportunities at the end of a clock. Well, I was definitely going to get there, and that's the concept of second cuts. And uh, this, it, this is a concept that uh, it, it's my most popular YouTube video when I explained this a few years ago. And you've seen it a lot internationally. You've seen it a lot at the NBA level. And I believe that you're one of the first college programs when you're at Villanova that started to do this, which is cutting off a drives, cutting off a ball screen, and creating advantage where there wasn't an advantage simply because the help defender loses sight. Can you talk about that and maybe some of the cues that you give to your weak side players or your ball side players to be able to cut off of a drive? Well, I think the first cue is if you feel your defender is not paying attention to you, then cut to the basket, right? And and by making a hard cut um, when the defender, you know, is ball watching, you know, I, I think it does two things. It, 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 is, it collapses the defense, right? It may make somebody on the help side have to react to your cut if it, or, or you're getting a layup. Um, you know, if you make that help side guy react now, the guy that's in the help, if he lifts, now that guy may, may be able to get a shot as long as that, uh, you know, the offensive player who has the ball is being poised and patient and is being strong with the ball in the paint where now he can, you know, get, get in there, jump stop, pivot, kick it out and find the open guy. Right. Um, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, when we, when we go um, post and rip and we put the ball in, you know, you have some automatics where, you know, like, you know, some, some, some teams, you know, they'll split screen on the, on, on the post, some screen, some teams they'll dive, you know, the, you know, the opposite slot guy, every time the ball goes into the post, but, you know, at the end of the day, you want to get somebody occupying the rim. And, and more times than not, you know, that, that guy that, that occupies the rim is really occupying the rim to get a layup or to, you know, you know force the help side to have to, you know, um, you know uh, react to that aggressive cut, which opens it up for, for, for um, you know, a shooter that's on the opposite side of the floor to get an open shot. Coach, I love the second cuts and I love that concept. And it's something that uh, is, is very easy to incorporate. And it's a way to empower the weak side. Can you also talk to me a little bit about what you teach the weak side in terms of holding their spot, cutting, or are they exchanging? What are some things that you like the weak side to be able to do? So, you know, you know, we, we were always taught to exchange on the weak side. Um you know, it, 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 it lifts guys out of the help and, and, um, and, 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 it, and it just, you know, encourages, you know, complete um, ball movement, player movement and spacing. You know, at times I think, you know, you, you want to have, you know, you know, a Villanova, we, you know, everybody was a knockdown shooter, right? So you're, you're, you're really moving around, you know, four guys on the perimeter who can all shoot the ball. You know, if you have a team that, that doesn't necessarily have, uh, you know, knockdown shooters at all four spots, then, you know, I think at times it's probably um, in your best interest just to keep your best shooter opposite, you know, just in that opposite corner occupying the floor. So now you put the help, the help defender in a, in a position where he has to make a decision. Is he helping um, and now potentially leaving that guy open for a shot or is he staying at home on a shooter, which, you know, you know, pulls him out of the help. So, you know, for, for coaches out there that, um, you know, are looking, you know, you know, for some clarity there. I, personally, I feel like, 
you know, if, if you're a team that, you know, maybe has one or two really good shooters, you know, if you can keep your shooters in the corners, um, you know, you really put the, the defense in a, in, a, in a pickle because now they have to make a decision, um, you know, as to what to do there. Hey, this is Chris Oliver from the Basketball Podcast. It's that time of year again, and all eyes are now on pro basketball and the start of Major League Baseball season. BetOnline.ag has all the betting action. In the NBA, the conference races are heating up as teams prepare to make their run for the playoffs. And if baseball is your first love, BetOnline has you covered. If you love hockey, golf, MMA, and championship boxing, BetOnline has it all. Every sport, every game, every matchup. BetOnline has you covered for all the odds and real-time updates and is the place to be for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to place and check in on all your favorite sports bets all the time. Head to the website or use your mobile device and bring home the game with BetOnline. Coach, thanks for supporting the podcast. I'm so excited to share this with you. Your outdoor experiences could be better, clearly better. Canon sunglasses are made exclusively with polarized lenses for optimal clarity. Using Japanese optics, Canon lenses are clearer, lighter, and stronger than other lenses, and nearly impossible to scratch. With frames handcrafted in Italy, Canon sunglasses elevate your experience outside with a degree of clarity beyond your wildest imagination. Coach, I have a pair and I love these and I want to share this exclusive code with you. Canon Cast 15 at Canon.com to receive 15% off your first pair. That's Canon Cast 15, K A E N O N C A S T 15. Canon clearly better. Yeah, I love that. And I love that. And you, you gave us three of the concepts catch to shoot, uh, drive in space, and then reverse the ball, make plays. Before you get into some of the other concepts, I just want to ask about reversing the ball because it struck me watching you guys over the last few years a little bit that, you know, even though reverse the ball is a concept, it's it's somewhat, I don't want to say overrated, but it's not the most important part. The most important part is taking advantage of advantage when you have it. So I'm well, wondering how you phrase that to your players and how you get them to understand that we don't want to just reverse the ball for the sake of reversing the ball to make it seem like a better play than it is. Well, so I, I think one of the challenges with reversing the ball is at times you when you don't get the full ball reversal, it's because your player that catches the ball in the slot believes that he has an advantage, right? So, you know, you know, you know, getting the getting that full ball reversal requires, you know, you know, guys to to um to pass up a good shot for the best shot for our team. Right. Um, and, and, um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's one of those concepts. It's, it, it takes time to, to grasp. It takes time to, to, um, to, to fully adjust and commit yourself to. Um, but, but I do believe that the, the, the biggest challenge with that ball reversal and I, and I, I think, you know, you, you look at a lot of teams, man, a lot of teams reverse the ball, man, a lot of really good offensive teams. You see Gonzaga play, you know, those guys move that ball. They get it from one side of the court to the other. You know, they're usually getting a good shot, right? And, um, you know, but but it's that willingness to make that extra pass that makes that concept so important. Yeah, it's great stuff. And, I'm, uh, you know, we talked about the weak side and we talked about these different things. But a lot of what makes it successful in terms of this is this small ball concept as well. And I'm wondering, what are the conversations that go into convincing players to be able to say that, listen, we're all somewhat equal. And, uh, you know, even though you might label yourself in your mind as a four, you're really not a four, right? Yep. 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 And, and, and it goes with the five too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Cause there's times, there's times where like we got guys on our team, man. And when I say, yo, putting you at the five, you know, you know, it, it starts, you know, it becomes a running joke amongst the team. We're like, Oh, you're a five man. And like that guy gets, you know, that guy, that guy, you know, he, he frowns his face up. Cause he's like, yo, I'm not a five man, but. You know, the one thing that we talk about is, man, we want basketball players. And, you know, you look at NBA now, you know, a guy like Anthony Davis, <laughs> like he, Joel Embiid, like those dudes are bona fide five men, but they shoot threes. So yeah. that's what gives those guys an advantage on the floor um, and, and, and amongst all the other significant things that they bring to the table. They can also stretch the floor. Right. So, 
you know, I think the the utilization of the three point line is so important. Um, you know, you look at so many teams, you know, across college basketball, they really take advantage of it by putting four or five shooters on the floor. I think Coach Wright, um, you know, was the was the visionary um, when when he went four guards, right? Um, you know, uh, back in uh, I want to say, you know, what was that two thousand and four, two thousand five. Um, with, with, with Kyle Lowry, Randy Foy, Alan Ray, and Mike Nardi. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day now, I think just having, you know, uh, four guys on the floor, the ability to shoot, that's, that's like the equivalent of, of, of playing, uh, you know, a four guard offense now, like a lot of guys. And, and you look at it and we talk about how, you know, every, every big guy wants to be a perimeter player now. Right. But, but you see how the game has evolved and the game's evolved because, um, you know, the, the utilization of the three-point line has become um, so more prevalent in our game today. So prevalent, and which is fun as well in terms of those things. And uh, uh, wondering also about this, this concept of the jump stop. And obviously, like, uh, you know, it's, it, it, coaches obviously fall in love with the jump stop. But uh, what is your philosophy in terms of jumping to pass versus jump stopping to pass? Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of jumping in the air to pass. Um, you know, I, I believe that the same plays that you make um in the air, um, you can you can make on the ground. Um, there there are a few exceptions where, you know, at times, you know, you you know, you have to jump in the air to, to get a ball to a certain spot. But but I believe that, you know, you know, you know, staying on the ground gives you the best opportunity to not turn the ball over. Um, and you know, we 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 try to teach our guys to to, to make their passes on the ground. Yeah, it's great stuff. And uh, are there more concepts then? You've given us three of the concepts. Are there more concepts that we should be aware of? So that last concept is, is post and rip. And, um, and that's just really, you know, when we, when we get into our post game, understanding how we're um, understanding how we're cutting, pivoting and moving, you know, off of the post once the ball goes inside. So, so let's get into that a little bit, spacing for post players and spacing for players at the rim in terms of that. Because again, you've already talked about it doesn't have to necessarily be a traditional type of five player, but when you're out four out and there's a player at the rim, what are we talking about in terms of spacing and concepts there? So, you know, we, we always feel, we always want to fill both corners and, and, you know, that's, that's where our, where our spacing uh, begins and ends, right? You gotta, gotta fill the corners. You want to fill both slots. And, you know, and, and you want to, uh, if the ball goes into the post, uh, you, you want to you make sure that you get somebody diving at the basket. Somebody has to occupy the basket. So, you know, we have, you know, different ways that, 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 we'll, that we'll rip off of the post. Um, and those will really be reads based off of, you know, how we know the defense is going to play us. You know, so if, if we know that, you know, guys, um, you, know, you know, trap the post, we'll rip a certain way. If we know that guys may dig off of the post feeder, we'll rip a certain way. Um, but, but at the end of the day, after we rip, we want to make sure that we're, we're filling both corners. We get both slots filled and we're in a position where, you know, if the ball um, gets into the paint, you know, you know, somebody can get into the vision of that guy if it's stuck. And now we can, you know, get open shots and, and keep the ball moving if we don't have an open look. Love it. I mean, simplicity is really what comes to mind in terms of this, but as we know, it's not simple to teach. It's not simple. So I'm wondering how you blend on court practice with video in terms of helping players and educating them about what you want in terms of these concepts. So, you know, one of the things we do is we, 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 we play, we play a lot in the off season. And one of the things that that really um, set us back last year, not being able to have an off season it, it took away our ability to really ha- hammer down on our concepts. So, you know, once we get into the off season, you know, we'll, we'll play a lot of four on four, a lot of three on three. Um, and, and we'll just play games just based off of the concepts, nothing else. So we'll give our guys limitations, rules and restrictions, and we'll force them to play out of those concepts so that the, the concepts can become second nature. The spacing and the decision-making can become second nature. And, um, and then what we do is, you know, as a coaching staff, you know, we will break down film with our guys and we'll show them, um, you know, you know, uh, different clips of themselves, you know, and, you know, you know, teach them how to make the right reads and decisions once the ball goes into the post. 
Yeah, it strikes me as this is the great way to play pickup, right? This is a great way to scrimmage in the offseason or obviously yeah. at the Y or wherever you go. Like this yeah. is the way you would want to play. So this makes sense that you would develop it through that in the offseason. What does it look like in season then in terms of your practices? Is it more whole part breakdown or is it part whole breakdown? How do you approach it? So in practice, in the season, we'll do, we'll do guard forwards breakdown because a lot of the, a lot of the spacing um, and the concepts, you know, they, they, it, it's different for the guards and the forwards, right? So, you know, we give our guards different reps of, you know, driving, spacing, reversing the ball to make a play, catch a shoot you know, in three on three games or two on two or four on four games once the season starts. And then we'll break it down with our forwards um in, in games of two on two or one on one or or um or you know just in drills with our coaching staff where they're getting live reps of you know their specific roles in in our spacing within our offense. And then we'll bring everybody together and put it together um uh, in, in a five on five setting. Talk to me a little bit more about one-on-one because I can imagine what it looks like. This isn't just check the ball, play one-on-one. These are, this is one-on-one within the concepts that you're trying to do. So you set them up and use constraints or different things like that to be able to shape your players learning, I imagine. Yeah. So, so one of the, one of the things that you talk about reversing the ball to make a play. So a lot of times we'll go one-on-one out of the corner and, you know, we'll, we'll have a defender, you know, start in the paint coach will be in the slot and he'll reverse it. And then the defender will have to close out. So now, our guys get reps of, you know, playing one-on-one out of the corner with a guy closing out on you. And then on the flip side, it gives our defenders the opportunity to work on closing out, guarding guys one-on-one, stopping a guy from getting into the paint chest and drives. We always have a live coach. So if a player, you know, tries to make a play, we'll give them limited dribbles. So we'll say we'll give you, uh, you know, two dribbles in a one-on-one game, right? So now you can't just over dribble and use eight dribbles to get to a shot. So now you have to focus on how am I going to utilize my shot big? How am I going to utilize my drive and get the most out of these two dribbles? And if you don't have a shot, then you always have a live coach to kick it out to. So it teaches our guys how to make the right decision, not just force a shot that's contested out of necessity. If I don't have a good shot, I won't force it. I'll I'll make the kick and then I'll space back out and then keep playing one-on-one. Well, I love that because I do think that one-on-one without that option or without constraints creates this bad shot mentality where I've got to take a bad shot because I have no choice. So this yeah. takes them out of that and builds that selflessness within what you're trying to do within these concepts, right? Yep, exactly. How do you incorporate analytics then into this? You talked about you're okay with the pull-up if players can shoot anal- uh, shoot the pull-up. So talk to me about how modern analytics get incorporated into this. Well, I, I think one of the things that we that we have to really focus on is because catch to shoot is our first concept. I think it's a cop out for our players at times where it's like, all right, yo, he sells to catch to shoot. He wants to be aggressive catch to shoot. So at times we settle for threes. Um, so, you know, really emphasizing getting paint touches and and using the analytics of, you know, you know, are we getting paint touches? How many possessions within uh, a four minute war did the, did the ball touch the paint, right? And, and then once we, you know, we get into timeouts and, and huddles, you know, just reiterating it to our guys, where it's like, all right, guys, we, you know, I mean, out of that four minute war now, we, 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 only, we only touched the paint twice, right? We, we, got, we got to get more paint touches um, in, in, the, in this next four minute segment, right? So, um, you know, it, you know that's, that's what we use the analytics for. Um, and then, um, you know, once we get into the off season, we use the analytics individually to show our guys, you know, what their, what their sweet spots are, um, you know, what, what areas they need to improve. And, and now um, individually, um, when, when our guys get with our coaches, we put a plan together to help our guys um, get better in the areas that they need to get better at based on the numbers and the analytics. I'm wondering then how, uh, and, and I'm not saying you're an offense first coach or vice versa, because you've already talked about defense in the intro, but I'm wondering how your offensive mentality in terms of these concepts influences how you teach and what type of defense you play, if any. So, you know, and, and all practices, because our guys are so wired to catch the shoot, it puts us defensively in a position where you know, we, I think we do a pretty good job of defending the three-point line. At least we have 
um, you know, in, in, in the last couple of years. I think this past season may have been, um, you know, our worst effort in, in defending the three point line. Um, you know, but but, you know, we, we, we really want to defend the three point line. We want to get out and, and pressure the ball. We want to know personnel. And, and then on the flip side, you know, we want to be uh, an, a, a really sound help defensive team where, you know, we, we do a good job of reading chest in the help side um, defensively. And when we say read chest, it means that that help defender is, is reading whether or not, you know, it's a blow by or whether or not the offensive uh, player is, is, is being contained. And then that, you know, determines your decision uh, as a help defender as to whether to step up and take a charge or go for a block or, you know, stay at home on the line of a shooter. The other thing that can impact it is if you're matched on a shooter, and, and we talked about it a little bit, you know, a lot of times guys want to drive the ball to get shooter shots. So now if you're matched up on a shooter on the help side of the floor, um, you know, being aggressive and decisive, making that decision, if you read that it's a blow by and you're stepping up to take a charge, and, you know, if you think that guy has it got under control, then you want to stay at home on that shooter and not allow that guy to get a rhythm, catch the shoot three out of driving space. So, you know, our concepts um, and the way we play, it really helps us uh, in terms of being able to guard and, and know personnel and understand, uh, um, you know, different matchups and how we need to defend in a man to man. Well, I love that. It just shows how connected the two things are when you when you build a build a program based on what you're talking about here, which again, I imagine is fun to play and it's fun to practice and those different things. It also speaks to the importance of two-way teaching within a lot of what you're doing, right? You're coaching offense and defense at the same time. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And and that's where my staff comes into play. Um, you know, our our, our staff will will have, you know, offensive coach, uh, defensive coach. And, and, and we have like a special teams coach who really coaches rebounding on both sides of the floor. Um, who's going to the offensive glass, uh, making sure that when a shot goes up, we have guys that are tagging and warring around the basket. Um, but, but on, but on, um, you know, on the offensive end, you know, you know, I'll have one of my assistants pretty much, you know, put our guys through actions when we're playing out of our concepts and, and then me and one of our other assistants, we, we, we really focus on the details of the defensive end, our guys communicating, our guys jumping to the ball, uh, our guys staying in a defensive stance, are they head turning the entire possession? And then at the end, are we finishing each possession um, with a tag or a war so that we can effectively rebound the basketball? A tag being what we would consider a box out and yep, yep. a war being just compete. Is that what you mean in those two no, terms? So a war is more of a box out okay. and a tag is, uh, you know, on the perimeter. Um, you know, you know, if it's a long shot, you know, as opposed to like completely boxing out, just running and making contact uh, with, with, with the offensive player that's running at the offensive glass. So you tag him just to impede his progress and then go pursue the rebound. Right. So more of a tee up and, instead of turning your back. And, and th that's great. I love that terminology in terms of that. So I'm glad you shared that and explained that for us. Uh, the other part that you talked about already at the beginning was this concept of changing defenses to keep your opponents off balance. Can you talk a little bit more about that and then maybe some of the cues that lead to you changing defenses? Well, you know, one of the things is, you know, we, we want to be able to show some pressure. We, you know, this past year, we, you know, we, um, you know, we, we incorporated, um, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, full court pressure. Um, we played a lot more zone this year than we, than we, ha than we've had in the past. And I think a lot of that was, pretty much due to the pandemic and our lack of preparation and practice time to really get good, um, you know, at our habits. We had a young team this year. We, we returned, um, you know, you know, uh, a lot of guys that, that hadn't necessarily, you know, you know, played significant minutes for us. Um, and, you know, we really used like the early stages of the season to, to really, um, you know, you know, get good defensively and, 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 and connect ourselves on offense and, 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 and we and we had some growing pains early and I felt like we got better as the season went on. Um, but, you know, this year, um, you know, a lot, lot more zone, um, you know, in the, in the past, we, 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 we love to play, you know, straight man to man, um, you know, pick you up 94 feet in your face, um, pressuring the ball in gaps, playing personnel. And then, you know, we, 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 we um, veer to you know, switching man to man, which at times you know, could, could throw our, our opponent off because in one minute we're guarding one way, the next minute we switch it up, we guard, 
guard you differently. And, you know, one of the things that we really, um, you know, prioritize in recruiting is, is finding interchangeable pieces that can, that can, um, that can guard multiple positions. Um, so, um, you know, that's something that, that we're excited about. I think that's something that, you know, that, that we have right now that's going to give us the ability to, to really be effective on a defensive end. Yeah, it's great. And uh, obviously I'm wondering if in terms of the focus then in terms of that, like, is it a, a defense where you're interested in creating turnovers or are you trying to generally, again, restrict the type of shots they get or matchup based? What are you doing in terms of defensively then with that type of system? You know, we, we want to be aggressive and decisive. Um, we, we, we don't necessarily say that we want to create turnovers, but we don't want the offense to be comfortable, right? We don't want guys to be able to, you know, get their normal shots. Um, so, you know, I, I think I think that's the the biggest thing for us. Um, you know, um, if we got a guy that's really good in ball screens, all right, well, you know what, man, we're going to trap you sometimes and we're going to switch it sometimes and, and we're not going to allow you to get clean looks, right? If you have, you know, uh, guys that are, are really good in like screening actions, well, at times we're going to switch those screens. So you don't get the shots that you ordinarily get. And then sometimes we may play zone. So now you, you know, you're, you're, you're getting thrown off by, um, you know, our, our, our switching of defenses, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I think the most important part of it is having guys that have the ability to guard the basketball, regardless of what defense you're playing, because you can do all of these things. And if the guy that's guarding the ball is getting beat off the dribble and you got to break down, then, you know, your defense isn't going to be effective. So one of the things that, you know, we, you know, we, um, you know, we started doing, um, you know, in, in our postseason work here is, is playing a lot of one-on-one because I think it really boils down to guys' ability to guard the ball one-on-one. You know, you get in late shot, uh, late shots, shot clock situations it really comes down to an ISO or post up, right? And, 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 and you got to be able to, you know, defend the ball, defend the post one-on-one. Uh, without needing a whole lot of help. Love it. Love it. And uh, I, I guess the other part that that I, I guess I'm struck by is that, you know, it's it's somewhat of a modern defensive system, right? In that sense that you're flexible and adaptable and rather than rigid in terms of what you do. Well, it's so hard to be rigid anymore because of, totally <laughs> because because you can't foul. You can't touch anybody anymore, man. You know, and 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 I would say, Chris, that my style was rigid. Um, you know, my first couple of years, like, you know, you know, people, everybody would say, yo, Ash, man, you get your team to play so hard, man. But I'm like, yeah, but we fouled so much. And that's why we, that's why we lose games. You know what I mean? So it's like, we're playing hard. We compete. Now we got to get to the point where we're playing hard and we're playing smart and we're using our technique, um, to our advantage so that we're not in foul trouble and we're putting ourselves in a position where, you know, we're fouling less and we're giving ourselves a better chance to win games. Yeah, it's fun. It's great. And uh, you talked about, I have to come back to shot fakes a little bit and and kind of get your philosophy and get your understanding of that because, you know, it seems to be somewhat of a contradiction in terms of catch to shoot that shot fake is such an important part of it because sometimes shot, shot fakes take away the shot as much as there's also a great decision and a great read. Can you talk to me about how you balance that philosophy? Well, I think you have different teams that defend the three point line different ways. Right. So, you know, you have pack line teams that are going to close out short and, and they're just going to contest your shot. And then you have some people that fly at shooters. So you have to be able to recognize the difference. Right. And there's going to be times where, you know, you're playing against a pack line team and you know, like, okay, man, like, you know, that ball comes to me, I'm going to be open because they're not going to fly at me. I catch the shoot and it may be contested, but you know, you got to catch the shoot it just to put the defense on notice at times. And then there's times where you're playing against teams that, you know, they may, you know, they, they may fly at shooters and, and, and scramble and, and, and not mind that. And, you know, you know, you have to be willing to, you know, you know, slow your shot fake down, take your time, draw the defender in, and then get to your drive, jump stop, and then, uh, you know, get to a hop jump or, or, or the, whatever the next play is for you. But utilizing your shot fake gives you the ability to make a clear play as opposed to, you know, the pass coming to you. Now you just drive and now the defender just cuts you off or takes a charge because 
it's obvious that you're not catching the shoot. So we think that catching the shoot gives you the ability to see the floor, recognize how you're being closed out on, recognize where your next play is, as opposed to the alternative of catching it and just putting your head down and drive. Yeah, it's great stuff. And Coach, uh, we can tell, I mean, we can hear your passion for the game and for teaching and for your program and all the different things that go with it. And uh, as I said at the beginning, upward trajectory for your program. But man, what a conference the Atlantic 10 is. I got to say, it's one of the most enjoyable conferences to, to watch year after year. You know, the, the, Atlantic 10, the Atlantic 10 is one of the most underrated conferences in the country. And, and the thing about it is it's just getting better to add um, some talented young coaches and, uh, you know, Kyle Neptune at at, uh, at, at Fordham, he's going to do a great job at Fordham. Um, it's my brother, and uh, I'm not looking forward to competing against him, uh, but, but I know he's going to do a great job at Fordham. And, and Kim English, um, you know, just uh, taking over George Mason, uh, you know, great deal of respect for Kim and, 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 and what he's done uh, as a player and, and, and as a coach. Um, and, and I know he's going he's gonna to do great things down at George Mason. But, you know, when you, when you look at our conference, um, so many um, great, great coaches and, and, and great programs. And, and, and LaSalle, we're, 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 we're trying, to, trying to dig and scrap and, and claw our way to, to the top of that deal. And, um, you know, the one thing that I want everybody to know is that, you know, Atlantic 10 is high major basketball. It's not a mid-major league. Um, you know, the, the teams in our league, um, you know, we, we've had pros. We've had uh, programs that have made deep runs in the tournament. Um, you know, we, we have, you know, unbelievable coaches and, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, the, the A-10 should, should get a little bit more respect. Um, and, 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 uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just fortunate to be a part of it and, and, and we're just going to keep digging and scrapping calling and, and, and trying to, trying to battle and get our way to the top of this league, but there's no nights off. There's no nights, no nights off. And, uh, you know, and that's the other part. I mean, you, you can talk to this briefly. You've already referred to it a little bit in terms of some of the challenges from this season, especially as a coach that's still developing their program, is that you lost a lot of the consistency that you had over the last two years. And that's not an excuse. That's a reality. And some of those challenges. So I'm sure you're excited to get back to a normal offseason in terms of development and uh, everything that goes with that too, aren't you? Absolutely. So last year was so significant for us and, and for so many other programs uh, because of that, right? So many programs, if you're not a program that's recruiting, you know, uh, five-star talent and even the programs that are recruiting five-star talent. And we saw that this year with Duke and Kentucky, you know, you know, without an off season, it's hard to get uh, everybody to uh, develop and establish the chemistry and the understanding of, you know, you know, how your team needs to play to be effective. Right. Um, you know, all of that work is done in the summertime. Right. So, you know, in addition to, um, you know, us not having, you know, that time, you know, we, you know, we had a, a couple of guys that were coming off of significant injuries um, that didn't get the off season that, that, that we were hoping. Um, and, and then, you know, some of our better players were our freshmen that ordinarily you bring those guys on campus in the summer, you get to whip them into shape during the summertime. We're doing that um, in uh, September, October, November, um, you know, getting those guys in, in shape when, when usually you, you have the ability to do that in June uh, July and August. So I'm really looking forward to, to this off season. I think our guys are too, and we're looking forward to making significant, uh, uh, strides in Atlantic 10 next year. Well, I have no doubt you will coach. And I cannot thank you enough for sharing the game with us and sharing these concepts and philosophies with us. Uh, just tremendous stuff. Chris, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the basketball podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things Basketball Immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.